Hello A-level students and welcome to this lesson in the series of lessons examining uh, the construction of narrative in The Handmaid's Tale. This lesson is going to explore the concept, concept of schema in The Handmaid's Tale and we're going to explore the way that uh, our preconceptions of different ideas help us to interpret Offred's narrative. So we're going to start by taking a bit of a detour into, well, firstly, philosophy and then psychology. And to answer the question, what is a schema? So the question um, is basically asking how we, or schema answers, how we make sense of and store information in the brain, particularly the way that we categorize things. And we also think about the way that schema can influence how we interpret the world around us. And there's a kind of a progression of this idea of schema, the plural of which is schemata, um, through um, philosophy and psychology, beginning with Kant, who proposes this idea of um, schemas being these processes that we use to categorize things. And Piaget there says that we are creating and updating schemata through our experiences, especially in childhood, and they provide kind of frameworks of knowledge through which we interpret the world. And then finally, uh, psychologist Bartlett then proposes that these frameworks for our experience are not just um, passive, but they actually, uh, these, uh, sch these schemata actually affect the way that we perceive events and that we actually use um, our schemata in the construction of meaning. And this can be uh, identified uh, in, uh, in literature that we read, where we bring existing frameworks of knowledge and use them to interpret the text. So to summarize that information, um, schema uh, is the way, or a schema is a way that we categorize uh, information that we receive. And you often get uh, the metaphor of a sort of a filing cabinet or a filing system used for this. So we encounter something new, um, we find our right file, we try and fit it in, I guess, to the right box. Um, and if it fits, brilliant, we interpret it that way. But if it doesn't fit, then maybe um, we update our file, we update our, um, our information on that particular topic. So why is this relevant to us um, studying language and literature? Well, these expectations, these sort of frameworks of knowledge, we use very much to fill gaps in the text. Um, authors uh, direct us to the right sort of blocks or files of information and if we're using the same kind of uh, schema that the author is using then we can interpret the text correctly particularly in interpreting um, gaps by making assumptions about um, about the things that are being presented to us but we also can use our um, these schemata to create meaning in the text when there is none uh, and this is often something that happens in um, reading um, uh, texts that are older texts where perhaps um, a modern way of viewing the world gives readers um, a different kind of framework for understanding the text and um, particular uh, situations or ideas are interpreted differently from readers reading in a modern age than they were intended by a writer writing in a, in a pre-modern age. So in that way we can say that these frameworks for, for knowledge um, they actually help us to kind of create meaning in the text sometimes where it isn't explicitly given. Um, this is a really interesting question and it's addressing the idea of how active a reader is in the process of making meaning in the text or interpreting the text and I guess we could possibly suggest the idea that the text kind of comes alive in the mind of the reader and that has some kind of independent truth um, uh, independent of what the writer intended. Um, let's have a think about schema in action. So this is, you'll identify this as the very opening um, uh, part of The Handmaids. And we can ask the question about what sort of judgments um, we as readers make about the time and location of this opening paragraph. What judgments we make about the setting. Or what frameworks do we bring into action that help us to interpret what's being presented to us in this section. Um, pause the video at this point. Ask yourself what frameworks of knowledge you have 
about the setting in this section that enable you um, to interpret the things that are being presented to you and then in a second I'll review some of those aspects. Okay, so you might have identified in that opening paragraph that the building was formerly a college or a school, but you weren't explicitly told that. You might have identified that the imagined dancers were young people, but you weren't explicitly told that. You might have identified a, a sort of a description of changing dress habits um, that seems to follow generational change. We go from um, felt skirts to mini skirts and then earrings and spiky green hair, which sounds a bit like kind of a different generations of dress habits. But that information wasn't specifically given to you either. Um, you may also have interpreted this uh, kind of undercurrent of teenage sexual desire. Um, and of course, that's hinted, but that's not also explicitly given to you. So none of that information. Um, was given to you there, but you instead accessed um, frameworks in your mind, particularly probably what you know about um, American uh, colleges and schools, uh, graduation dances, um, your scheme uh, schemata about um, you know teenage dress habits and behaviour, your cultural schemata of the uh, 1950s and 60s through to the 80s would have enabled you to um, kind of interpret meanings in this text, sometimes where there were none. Now, Atwood as a writer um, doesn't provide you all of the information. Of course, much of this information is implied. And I guess schema allows, uh, a schema allows um, writers to, um, to imply information for their readers. Read on the remainder of um, chapter one, uh, which is, of course, just a short chapter, um, and ask yourself what contrasting um, schema then comes into play um, against this framework of um, uh, teenage uh, teenage school school years and dancing. There's a contrasting schema that comes into play. Um, and ask yourself how, as this chapter progresses, do different schemas uh, different schemata, sorry, interplay together to give us uh, a, maybe an unsettling view of Gilead. So to summarise, um, well, um, the way that schema are applied, uh, the way that schemata are applied in Handmaids, um, the novel is often presenting us with familiar things, um, things for which we have a functioning um, schema. But it also presents us with ways in which these familiar things are altered or different. And that has the effect of undermining our expectations. And so we start to construct a new framework for this imagined world of the novel. Um, and this is uh, one of the key ways that um, Atwood presents us um, with Gilead. So as you read on the rest of chapter one, you may have identified that um, the uh, schema coming into play, the framework of knowledge, was that of a prison or possibly a concentration camp with the descriptions of the guards and the cattle prods. And we're starting to then fill in other gaps which are very much in contrast with the world of um, young teenage freedom and rebellion and dancing and sexual desire. And by bringing these two schema, I guess, into conflict with each other, um, Atwood is showing us a, a new picture of an imagined and you know um, uh, an imagined world, a, a dark and twisted world. This, of course, can be related back to the function of dystopias uh, and the idea of um, a sort of a speculative fiction. Atwood's desire to present us with things that are um, recognisable and familiar but in, in new hypothetical combinations that enable us to um, evaluate the sort of what-ifs of our own society. And by, I suppose, bringing the world of the concentration camp into the world of um, the US high school, the US college, um, it's, we already begin to sort of revise our expectations of what this world looks like relative to the world that's familiar to us. So as you read the novel or as you uh, revise the novel, you might think about how these other frameworks of knowledge 
um, are used to interpret Gilead. Um, things such as shopping, marriage, skin care. There are many more that could be added to this list. Wherever you are bringing into play your own expectations and preconceptions of a particular aspect of society or a particular aspect of behaviour, and that's being used for you to not only fill in the gaps in what Atwood's telling you, but also it's being undermined by the society that Atwood presents um, by showing you these sort of changes in Gilead and you're having to revise the way that you see Gilead compared to the way that you see your own world. So sch schema are a very important uh, concept in, um, the, in the way that uh, Atwood establishes a dystopia. So in summary then, uh, in psychology schemas are, uh, schemata are frameworks for categorizing information in the brain and we use these schemata to uh, interpret information in the text by filling in the blanks in meanings. In The Handmaid's Tale, um, we use our existing uh, schemata, but these are also undermined or um, sometimes occasionally come into conflict with each other as we build a new picture of the world of Gilead. Um, thank you once again for your focus and attention. Um, make sure that you keep your notes fully updated and I'll see you at the next time. Bye.